Hi, and welcome to the Planet Driven Brands podcast. In this show, we will be discussing with our guests how brands they represent can help in the drive to build a better, more sustainable and safer planet. We will highlight brands as drivers of change and the role they play as influencers. How will brands positively impact the planet and its environment? This is what we're going to find out. Do brands actually have any responsibility to change? Planet Driven Brands Podcast, Episode 28. Today's guest is Shay Green, the co-founder of the Moonshot Collaborative and the founder and principal of Cultivate Insights. Today we'll be discussing the American consumer. Hi Shay, thanks you so much for coming on to our show. I wonder if you could give us a quick introduction. Of course, and it's my pleasure to be here, Nick. Uh, my name is Che Green, and I'm the co-founder of Moonshot Collaborative, along with my partner, David Binsikin. And our approach is to provide affordable and accessible research to the alternative protein space, but other sustainable businesses. Where do you stand and, and where do U.S. consumers stand in terms of brands' responsibility in terms of sustainability in the planet? Certainly, I think that there's an increasing onus on brands to have a more holistic approach to sustainability. And so what you're seeing in the U.S., and I imagine this is similar in other markets, you're seeing a bit of a dichotomy where you have a lot of startup companies that are pushing the sustainability approach because they are mission driven and that is part of their core ethos. And then you see the larger companies, more traditional food companies and other types of companies that are starting to take sustainability on board because they see that pressure rising, but not necessarily as pervasive throughout their product line as you might see for a startup or something like that. And so in terms of the responsibility, I think absolutely the responsibility is on brands to move in a more sustainable direction, but many of them are not going to do that without the consumer impetus there and the consumer sentiment being behind those changes, at least in the U.S., again, because you know they're very much focused on their bottom line, most of these corporations. And so if you're talking about a cost to move in a more sustainable direction, they need to see a commensurate benefit to that. And so as I, in the U.S., again, focusing there, we definitely see that growing in terms of consumer sentiment, but we're not there yet in terms of it being substantial enough to really move large corporations in that direction. So when you say in consumer sentiment, is that, is that all it is right now? Or is it a movement? Is it, is it a movement? Are we a long way from it being a movement? It's a very question and a, a, a very good question. At what point does consumer sentiment become a movement? And I don't know that I know the answer to that, but I do think that we're short of a movement yet. And I think it's largely, you know, maybe this is my cynical nature, but it's largely a feel good sort of a, approach right now in the United States. And I think it is shifting to becoming more substantial, but we're not there yet, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it certainly does. You've been engaged um, in animal advocacy for, for many years. I guess you've seen a, a sizable change since you first started out. What if you could just give us a, a snapshot of your journey as how you got to where you are now? Yeah, I have certainly witnessed a huge amount of change over the past couple of decades. You know, when I started off, there was a, my focus is generally research, as, as I mentioned at the outset, and that was my focus also in the animal advocacy and nonprofit world. I started a social science organization called Phonolytics. And that is the reason why is because understanding consumer sentiment, understanding behavior change and all of those things are essential to not only animal advocacy, but sustainability in general. And so what I've seen over the past couple of decades is an increasing strategic focus among the advocacy community, but also among smaller uh, corporations, mission-driven businesses that are moving in a more strategic and data-driven direction. And I think you're seeing that, Evan, to some extent with the, the success of something like a Beyond Meat and an Impossible Foods, where they do have large consumer insights departments, and they're using that to inform a lot of their activities. In terms of more generally the sustainability space, we're certainly seeing a tremendous amount of more focus. Again, it's largely at the rhetorical level rather than the actual practical level, but I'm seeing that shift. That's a pretty seismic shift just in the past, you know, 10, mm. five or 10 years, maybe not the last 20 years. No. It's been slow to come around, but it is increasing rapidly, I would say. Why? Why do you think it's happening now? 
no surprise, I think that the external pressures of climate change are the major impetus. You know, we see, I, I should back off actually, because for, for most people, and at least the US consumer, it is largely self-motivated, right? It is, it is largely about what will benefit me. We even, Moonshot Collaborative recently conducted a study where we looked at sustainability of plant-based foods. And we asked, what are your main motivations when you think about sustainability? And the, the main motivation was health. And so somebody in response to that said, it's sort of the better for me, better for we approach, right? And so when you look at self-interest, it can be very personal self-interest like health, or it can be the broader sense of self-interest, like we want to improve the environment for future generations and to have a healthier planet. And we're seeing all of those sort of a confluence of those things that are moving consumers and companies in that direction. But again, it's not... I don't see consumers changing their behavior drastically. It's more yeah. incremental changes. And that's where mm -hmm. I think, you know, the persuasion and I've been doing, I've been working on persuasion for the better part of, you know, 25 years in terms of moving people down toward a more ethical choice and ethical behaviors. And that's a hard slog, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that focusing a little bit on the animal advocacy and how it intersects with sustainability, the notion of these alternative proteins, the better tasting, cheaper alternatives to meat, for instance, are changing the default option for consumers rather than relying on persuading them to change their behaviors. So you're meeting them where they are in terms of taste, health, and sustainability, but you're not asking them to make huge drastic changes because they can still have a burger, for instance. And yeah. so that's where I think the, the real progress has been made, in the, at least in the animal advocacy community over the past decade or so. It's quite fair now that consumers are beginning to realize that food without meat does taste good. Absolutely. And I, I've told this story on a couple of different uh, podcasts, but my, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been vegan long enough that I remember when a veggie burger was a powder in a box yes. that you would buy and mix with water and go and fry up at home. And it was horrendous. Yes. Um, and so, you know, I'm not saying that the burgers are necessarily, you know, the culmination of our, our innovation. We're certainly going to be going much further than that in the alternative protein space. But we've come so far. And I feel like we're, we're reducing a lot of those historical barriers that people have had in terms of moving toward more ethical and sustainable food choices. Will there come a time, do you believe, in the future when the health aspect is taken as a given? So therefore, the consumer will start putting more pressure on on the other side of the sustainability um, uh, square, if, if for want of a better word? I, I, that's a great question. And I think that the answer is probably yes, but that we are quite a ways off from that. You know, because I mean, the average diet, at least in the United States, is still very unhealthy, right? So health is going to be a, a dominant factor in food choices for quite a while, as far as I'm concerned. I actually wanted to pivot now to, to Moonshot. And I'd just like you to, to tell us more about it and, and where, where you see it uh, headed. Sure. Yeah. And thank you for that. So as I said at the outset, you know, Moonshot exists to, to make research accessible and affordable to companies in this space and the space being, you know, any sustainable or animal friendly product. Our unique selling point is that we have a consumer research panel of several thousand people who are qualified plant-based buyers. So these are people who have purchased plant-based meat, dairy or eggs in the three months prior to signing up. And we've deeply profiled them. So we have something like 70, 75 different attributes on each of these wow. several thousand panelists. Everything from their demo basic demographics to what plant-based categories are they buying to who is the primary food shopper in the household, et cetera. And so the goal being that we can therefore ask questions on behalf of our clients and have all of those attributes available for additional analysis without having to repeat those questions. It's also useful for targeting. So if we had a, a client who wanted to target just, you know, people who are interested in plant-based egg alternatives, for instance, we can narrow in on those folks and do qualitative or quantitative research. So that's what we're trying to do is make that sort of consumer segment readily available for any company who wants that kind of insight. So you really know these these consumers. So here's a question for you, because I'm convinced there is what I call a plant based attitude. I guess there must be. And if there is, give me a, a snapshot of a plant based attitude, if you know what I mean. I, I think I do. Yeah. And it is it is that so, sort of holistic viewpoint of health and sustainability in animals. So when you look at sort of the motivations, if you will, for plant based eating, and, and I should actually back up and say, 
in the United States, roughly 40 to 45 percent of people qualify as the kind of person that would be in our panel. So it's still a very large segment of the population. Mm. That's that's that flexitarian, reducitarian, you know, consumer profile, yeah. which has just taken off in the U.S., but I believe also elsewhere. And so when you look at their attitudes and their motivations, for instance, it is, again, health is the number one. And then you get animals in the environment are essentially tied for the second most common motivation for why people are eating plant-based. In terms of the profile, not surprisingly, you do see it skew toward the younger generations. Um, and so you see millennials, you know, Generation Y is a huge driver of plant-based foods and, and consumption, uh, whereas the boomer generations are somewhat less so, those two. In terms of attitudes, it really is a lot of, you know, that, what, that self-interest that I mentioned earlier. So you're seeing plant-based buyers increase, it, it, I would say more so than the general average consumer, they have an interest in sustainability and sort of these broader ethics, but it's still not pervasive among plant-based buyers. Many of them are just doing it because they want to be slightly healthier or because they know that eating, you know, cutting out beef is better for the environment. And so these are folks who are making the switch, but they're doing it part-time and they're doing it in incremental slow ways. I get it. And I get the, the small steps. At some stage, We've all got to realize we've got to waste less food, for example, rather than talking about it. Is it the brands that got us by the solution or should the consumers be pulling that solution through? It can't be either or, right? Yeah. It has to be a, a partnership. There has to be some willingness for consumers to think about their choices and to move in that more sustainable direction. But they're not, we can't rely on that exclusively. Again, that whole 20 years of persuasion for relatively limited results, you know, we need also that impetus to come from the other side. And so you need corporations to, to both reduce their packaging waste, for instance, yes. you need to make more reasonable portion sizes, more education to consumers about how they can cook and utilize, you know, things like leftovers and stuff like that. So I, I can't see it being just one or the other. And I think even government has a role to play where mm -hmm. they're coming in and, you know, creating policies around food waste, at least at the industrial level and the food service level and things like that, that will hopefully trickle down into consumer behavior as well. So I really think it's all three of those that sort of some sort of three-way partnership that you get the persuasion, you know, side of the consumers, the demand-driven side from the companies, and then the codification and policy side from the government to help mm. enforce it. Yeah. So, so one, one last point then, um, you talked about big business and big corporations. Are they coming to the sustainable party kicking and screaming or are they now being are they now much more willing participants as you've just described i think it depends i think it depends on the company you know i, I do think that there's a fair amount of kicking and screaming and you know greenwashing slash humane washing happening from say the tyson foods of the world you know an example is tyson foods decided to move into the plant-based space they released uh, something they called a plant-based product that was a blended product uh, I think it included eggs. It might have even included, you know, meat. And I can't quite remember exactly, but it wasn't a purely vegan product. They have since backtracked on that. And so I think that there's there's should be skepticism of these very large traditional meat companies moving into the space, but also not to the point where we're ruling them out. Because I think we need them as well. It's almost I, I'm almost I care less about their motivations as long as they're moving in that direction in a truly meaningful way. Right. Yeah. But if it is just bottom line driven and not ethics and sustainability driven, because we need we can't do it with just the small companies and the startups. Mm -hmm. We need the larger, more entrenched traditional food companies to also help move consumers in that direction. Shay, that was really, really interesting. Thank you so much for coming on our show. It was absolutely my pleasure, Nick. Thank you for your great questions. Thank you. Thank you. Have a very good week. You do the same. It took about a, a, a snapshot, a moonshot of the American market. Um, what I'm fascinated about, it's actually very similar to the UK. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. The Planet Driven Brands podcast is the brainchild and copyright of Nick Jones and is broadcast in partnership with theplanetsagency.com. Planets Agency is a partnership of consultants and communications experts. We build planet-driven brands. During the series of shows, we'll be hearing from more experts and we would love for you to be involved. Please do comment or come back to us with questions. We'd be happy to engage. If you wish to be notified when our episodes are broadcast, please subscribe on the website. If you'd like to be part of the show, we'd love to hear from you. We look forward to many more entertaining episodes. Thanks again for listening. 